Now, Ephesians chapter 6, our next section of sermons. And our theme this year is be strong, be strong. I do not know how long it will take me to preach through these sermons. I know it took me a very long time to study them and to work on them. I read, uh, well, I read a whole book, uh, 280 some pages long. I written, I studied and referenced many of other books, but read just that book on just these verses that we're looking at from the book of Ephesians. And I want you to look there with me this evening, Ephesians chapter 6 and beginning at verse 10. Before I do that, let me say I got some more visitors tonight. Uh, I mentioned that Alicia and, Lu and, uh, and uh, Lucy Rosario were here this morning. Their husbands made it in, and they're both here tonight. Also, Kevin Wicker and his wife are here. Did you bring any children with you? No, no children, all right? Well, you got a night off. Good. Now, Brother Kevin uh, gave a testimony at our bus conference either this last year or the year before. Was reached through our bus ministry, serving in a church in town. Good testimony. Glad that he's here with us. So thank you all for coming, and thank you for being really faithful, working for Friend Day. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. How many think that's true? We've got a lot of spiritual wickedness in a lot of high places. If you wonder about that, just turn on the TV. Look at what's happening in the Senate and the White House and, and the United Nations and all around the world. Look what the people from Iran say uh, when they get a chance to speak and others like that. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Same thing in verse 13 is verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Take unto you the whole armor of God. That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, some people take that portion of Scripture and say, well, you know, times are really bad. I had a man say to me one time many years ago, maybe we're not starting the churches like we used to. Maybe we're not establishing Christian schools. Maybe we're not winning the world to Christ. But if we can just hang on to what we've got, we've done something. That's a great challenge for the next generation. Hang on to what we've got. Uh, young people, you don't get to build your own house, but you can try to keep ours from falling apart. You're not going to do any pioneer work, but maybe you can sweep out the cobwebs of the corners of the one we got and keep it from rotting, just hanging on what we got. Now, the trouble is, here's what it says. It says, having done all to stand. How many think you've done all the Bible reading you could possibly do? How many think you've witnessed to all the people you could possibly witness to? How many think you've spent all the time in prayer you could possibly spend? How many think that you've given all of the resources you have, time and talent and treasure, to the cause of Christ you could possibly give, all right? So we're not there yet. But we do need this armor. And we need to withstand in the evil day. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness and, on your, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, Paul is in jail. He is chained to Roman soldiers. The reason that he references the armor of the soldiers is because it's right next to him. It is a ready analogy. Now, it's not a perfect analogy. Some people get off track when they try to discern what the pieces of the armor mean because they think every piece has to have an exact, exact fit and that every piece will be entirely different than the other pieces. I'm not going to tell you that. Now, what would you think the sword of the Spirit is? The Bible says it's the what? Word of God. So then the Bible says, having your loins girt about with truth. What would you think that is? Where does truth come from? Word of God. A lot of people say, well, that can't be the Word of God because the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So this must mean personal integrity. Hey, i got news for you. You ought to have personal integrity, but that's not going to help you much in the battle if you don't have the Word of God. 
Now, that what it is, the first mention is of the Word of God as a defensive piece of our armor. Wherewithal shall a man cleanse his ways by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And the last piece of armor, it references the word of God, I believe, as an offensive piece of weapon. But then the Apostle Paul, in jail, facing potential execution, always had that risk in his life. Freedom robbed from him. He says, pray for me. What would you want people to pray for for you if you were in jail? Get out. Be safe while you're there. Be protected from evil people that might try to do you harm. Get a little extra money so you can buy some potato chips. And here's what he said. And for me, verse 19, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which, the gospel sake, I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein, in the bonds, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Can I say the Apostle Paul had every right to exhort us to be strong? Here is a man in jail. Here is a man in bonds, not just in jail, but a man who's chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day, three different shifts, coming in eight hours a time, as I understand it. And he says, pray that I'll be really bold in preaching the gospel while I'm in jail. Father, help us. Empower me by your Spirit to say the things that would please you and guide all of us to get what you want us to have from this time together. Help us not to look over our shoulder or think of the person next to us, but to let your word speak to our hearts. If there's anybody who doesn't know for sure they have a home in heaven, I pray you'd save them this evening. And if there are those of your children that need to obey you in baptism, unite with our church family, I pray they do that. And then, Lord, I pray that all of us would listen and obey as you speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Finally, brethren, now, why does he say finally? Well, the book of Ephesians is a quite interesting book. Three chapters of doctrine, three chapters of application. Three chapters of, uh, if you will, foundational truth, and, and three chapters of what you're supposed to do because you have the truth. Uh, he's talked to us about having unity in the body of Christ. He's talked to us about have, putting on the new man and putting off the old man. Uh, he's talked to us about redemption and the work of the Holy Spirit and our need for his power and how a husband should love his wife as Christ loved the church. And a wife should submit to her husband and children should obey their parents and parents should rear their children in the admonition of the Lord. And masters and servants should have the right relationship one with another and by the way, it's kind of interesting if you study it. Every time that God speaks to people in positions of leadership and those under leadership, He always speaks to the person under authority first and then to the person in authority. He first says, wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. And then He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and love your wife as you love your own body. He first says, children, obey your parents. And then He says, parents, raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He first says, servants, obey your masters. And then He says, masters, do right by your servants. Remember that you've got a master in heaven. Now, why is that? Here's a little freebie as we just consider the context of this portion of Scripture I pastored the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport for 43 years, three months, and nine days. No, no more than that, uh, 12 days. And you know I've had very little trouble. The longer I've been here, the less trouble I have. It would be easy for me to stay and kind of coast a while. I've been persuaded that it's God's will for pastors. Pastor Howe is going to take you new places and do great things. He's not going to change the DNA of the church. not going to change the stand of the church, but he'll add a lot of good things and he'll improve a lot of things. Do you know why I've had really a pretty easy time pastoring this church? you know why? I, I, I mean, I'm blessed. If I said, uh, send $1,000 to Joe Shakur, how many know who Joe Shakur is? But you know what happened? They'd write a $1,000 check to Joe Shakur. Nobody tells you is that in the budget that the deacons know about it. Who is that? Joe Shakur, is a, uh, he's an Iranian mullah friend of mine. No, he's a Baptist preacher, and 
Wilson, North Carolina. And people are very kind. Of, now everything's inspected. Everything's audited. There are no secrets about the way we spend the money. Anybody wants to can come look at the books. But you know why I've had the, the liberty that I've had and been able to lead the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport all these years? I want to tell you why. It's because you let me. Lee Robertson said everything rises and falls on leadership. I understand that. But it's equally true everything rises and falls on fellowship. Do you know why I lead our home? Because my wife lets me. I'm the man of our house, and I have my wife's permission to say so. Suppose my wife just decided, honey, I'm quitting church. And uh, she'd be around shopping on Sunday mornings. Or she said, I'm going to go out in, uh, in short shorts and a tank top. Now, if anybody at her age is qualified to do it, she is. Not spiritually, but... So what do I do? Honey, you can't dress like that. So I'm going to. Now what do I do? Do I, get to, do I get to hit her? Do I get to tie her up, lock her in the house, put her in the basement? No, I have authority uh, from God and the family, but I have no power. A policeman has authority. His badge gives him authority. If he has power, his gun gives him power. If you don't obey the badge, you might obey the gun. Pastors have authority. They don't have any power. And what happens in your family, what happens in this church, what happens as Pastor Howe becomes the pastor, a whole lot of it is dependent not just on the leader, but on the follower. And God says, do you know when the follower does their job, it's easier for the leader to do their job. I've told you that often as you look in the Bible, you see how the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Philippi, and he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. You guys are great, man. You're just wonderful. And he writes to the church at Thessalonica, and he says, from you sounded out the word of the Lord, and I didn't need to say anything. And he said, now I live. If you stand fast in the Lord, he said, you're my glory. You're my joy. You're my hope. You're my rejoicing in the day of Jesus Christ. And he wrote to the church at Galatia, and he said, fools. That's what he said, oh, Foolish Galatians. And he wrote to the church at Corinth and he said, You're carnal. You've got strife and divisions. You're fleshly. You're not spiritual. Why did he do that? I posited the possibility one time that the Apostle Paul was bipolar. And he wrote to Corinth and uh, wrote to Galatia on a low when he was unhappy. And he wrote to Philippi and Thessalonica when he was on a high. That's not true. You know what the difference was? The difference wasn't in the leader. He was the same. The difference was in the follower. So the Apostle Paul's talked about all that really important stuff. Be filled with the Spirit. We walk in unity. Put on the new man. Put off the old man. And then he says, finally. Uh, that's kind of like the preacher saying, and in conclusion. That doesn't mean it's almost over. He may go on for quite a while after that. But it means there's something remaining. Now, you've gotten all this great stuff. You've got this doctrine. You're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're God's children. He has predestined and foreordained that you should walk in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ and that you should bring forth praise to His glory. And, uh, and He's told you all this stuff about how to be filled with the Spirit and how to exist in a family and how to have unity. And then He says one more thing. Finally. We'll see as we go through this series an attitude and an avenue and an appropriation and an armor or some pieces of armor. And then ultimately, if we go ahead and go that far in the passage, we'll see an activity that Paul closes it all out with. But notice tonight the attitude. Be strong. Now we're going to talk about the what of being strong as we begin this series this evening. The word for strong in the Bible is the word endunamo'o. It's the same as the word dunamis. It's a form of that word. It's the word from which we get our word dynamite. When the Bible says in 2 Timothy, uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. It's the word dunamis, the same word, a form of the word that you find here. It's a really 
it's a lot of power. It's a lot of strength. It means to empower. It means to be sober. It means to be ready. It means to be of good cheer. It means to be steadfast. It's talking about the disposition with which you face life. Did you know that a whole lot of life is dependent upon your attitude? Do you know there are people out there who try to push you around? But they can only push you around if you let them. I'm not suggesting be mean or be unkind. David Gibbs, he'll be here November 18th. I'll be all present. Love Brother Gibbs and love uh, hearing him speak. Brother, Brother Gibbs uh, talked to a preacher friend of mine in Toledo, and, and my preacher friend said, I did what David Gibbs said. It worked out fabulous. He said, I got monkeyed up by the airline." And uh, I, I missed a day, and it was their fault. It wasn't weather. It was mechanical. And they were just going to give you a flight on the next day. And I said, ma'am, that's not acceptable. And she kind of looked at him. She said, well, we'll do this. And he said, ma'am, that's not acceptable. And she offered something else. And he said, I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. And finally she gave him what he thought was a pretty fair deal. He said, you and I had a deal. We had a contract. You didn't fulfill your contract. You caused me some difficulties because you haven't kept your obligation. And you need to make that right. He wasn't mean. He wasn't unkind. But he didn't let her push him around either. I was in Oklahoma coming back home from a meeting. There was a small plane. And at the last minute, some bigwig came by. And he had a little entourage with him, and he went in front of us all in the line to get on the airplane, and they put him on the airplane, and then they said to several of us, we're sorry, but there are no seats on this plane. We're overbooked, and you'll have to wait for the next flight. <laughs> now, we had the seats. He just came in at the last minute, and because he was a big shot, he took our seats. How many think that's terrible? How many think that's fair? I thought it was terrible then. I thought it was nice one other time when they put me in front of somebody else. I didn't know they were doing it, but they did. And the lady, I said, ma'am, uh, I said, do you think we're entitled to some compensation? She said, yes, I'm going to give you a $50 voucher. <laughs> I had not heard Dr. Gibbs' method of saying it then, so I just said, that's not good enough. She said, okay, $250. I said, that's better. How do you face life? Do you go through it timid? Do you go through it expecting to be beat up? Do you go through it like uh, somehow you don't belong there? When you go soul winning, do you knock on the door and your attitude is kind of high? Uh, I'm really sorry to disturb you. I, I wish I wasn't here, and I know you wish I wasn't here, and I'm supposed to offer you this, and if you please tell me you won't take it, I'll leave. And you got like... Hey, suppose and I said, we need a bunch of volunteers to go around to the neighborhoods and give people checks for $1,000. Now, first of all, you'd want to know what neighborhood, and you'd want to move there quickly. But wouldn't that be fun, giving away $1,000 checks? Can you imagine the kind of response you get? You go to everybody's door, hey, I've got a check for $1,000 for you and your family from the First Baptist Church of Israel. Wow, that's really cool. Hey, guess what? we got something better than a $1,000 check. we got the gospel of Jesus Christ. It changes people's destiny forever and forever and forever. They may not all want it, but bless God, it's a good thing we're giving out. And we don't have to go out timidly and cowardly and feeling like we're intruding on somebody. Hey, we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We have a commission for from God. We have the best news in all the world to give people. Don't be wimpy about it. Be strong. August 26, 1990. Margaret Thatcher was called the Iron Lady of British politics. She was the first female prime minister and, and uh, I'm like one fellow said, she may have been the best man for the job. She and Ronald Reagan were very, very close. She said Ronald Reagan was the second most important man in her life, the most important being her husband. Ronald Reagan had finished his two terms. George H.W. Bush had become the president. And it seemed that, uh, at least from the British perspective, that President Bush was a little more worried about what uh, Germany and other European countries uh, thought about what they were doing. Uh, uh, Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. And he was on the telephone with Margaret Thatcher, and Margaret Thatcher said to George H.W. Bush, George, this is no time to go wobbly. 
Wow. Interesting that lady had to tell our president, the president of the greatest nation in the world, the strongest nation in the world, the biggest and most powerful military in the world, and she from a power that had been declining for generations was the one who said essentially, hey, George, be strong. Don't wimp out now. We've got a, a dictator, a tyrant that has invaded an innocent country and we as a community of nations are going to have to come together and do something about that. And the Apostle Paul says, hey, hey, don't miss this. Finally, one more thing. In conclusion, face life with courage, not with cowardice. Uh, uh, don't go wobbly. Hey, I, I'm a little tired of people going wobbly. I'll show you later in the sermon what happens when a church's whole mentality is to try to accommodate itself to the current whims and trends of society. It all started out with a man named George Barna. He was a pollster, and he said, I'm going to figure out why people don't go to church. And so he took a survey of unsaved people and said, what don't you like about church? And some of them didn't like preaching. And some didn't like the gospel, and some didn't like having to dress up, and some didn't like the music, and, and some didn't like the fact that it, you know, it, the building didn't remind them much of a bar. And so he created a, a whole mentality of, well, you find out what unchurched Harry likes, and then you make a church so that unchurched Harry will feel comfortable. Now, don't misunderstand me. When people visit here, I want them to feel welcome. We don't have handshaking time because my sermon isn't long enough to fill in the entire two hours. We have handshaking time. I want you to be nice to people. Some people know we love you. We're, we're glad you're here. You're welcome here. Uh, we want everybody to feel welcome. But, but you know, I'm not interested in trying to appeal to the fleshly nature of an unsaved person in the way I conduct my church service. Well, if I did what they wanted, we'd serve beer. If I did what they wanted, we'd have the same music that you'd have as a night, in a nightclub somewhere. If I did what they wanted, we would do as some churches that called themselves Bible preaching churches have done and have Booze party, champagne party. And you know what happens to them? They keep cutting pieces of the truth off until pretty soon there's not much left. And when you hear, as we get there, what some of them have said about the gospel, the way they've watered it down, they don't want to say you're a sinner because people don't like to be told they're sinners. They don't want to say you're on your way to hell because people don't like to hear about that. They, they don't want to hear that they have a lost soul because people don't like to hear about that. So they just tell them that God loves them and He's got a wonderful plan for their life and He wants to do great things in their life. No, that's all true. But you know what? To be saved, you've got to be saved from something. And the Bible says, without the law, I had not the knowledge of sin. The law was my schoolmaster to bring me to Jesus Christ. And we don't need people to be weakening the gospel. We don't need people to go wobbly on the gospel. We need people to stand up and say, Jesus is the only way to heaven. Your sin is sending you to hell. If you trust Jesus, you can go to heaven. That's what the Bible says. Charles Stanley has a son named Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley has a very large and popular church in Alfreda, Georgia, outside of Atlanta. And I'll say this again later in this series of messages. But last Sunday, uh, he had a little blog. I was on a Fox News app, and my preacher friend, Brother Tim Rasmussen, showed it to me. And he had the five reasons people leave church. Reason number one, they were taught that the Bible was the basis of their faith. And his attitude was, we can't teach them the Bible is the basis of their faith. Because he read about a lady and she'd read a book that supposedly proved some contradictions in the Bible. And now that she thought the Bible had contradictions, then the basis of her faith was gone. Well, the way you do that is you answer those questions. Uh, you, don't, you know, he said, no, he said, the Bible's not the foundation of our faith. Jesus is. Um... Where did you learn about Jesus? How do you know whether it's the real Christ or another Christ, as Paul talked to the Galatians about? And what do you do with Psalm 138 and verse 2, where the Bible says, Thou hast magnified thy word even above thy name. Hey, if I don't have the Bible, I don't have anything. My foundation is in the Word of God. And, and I say to people that are saying, well, you know, we just have to be a little more, more 
sensitive in the way we explain the gospel. I want to be kind. I want people to understand. I want to be the nicest guy that comes to their door. I want to do good deeds. The other day I was at the library and I saw that a bunch of weeds in the in the uh, flower beds around there and I said to the new librarian, Amber Huey, could I send over a few guys and pull some of these weeds and some of our guys that work maintenance around here went and got some of the weeds out of there. I, I think that's a nice thing to do. I'm all for doing that kind of stuff. Uh, but you know what? I, I, if you like the gospel, I'm really glad and I'm going to preach it. And if you don't like the gospel, I'm sort of sorry, but I'm still going to preach it. Not going wobbly. There's no time to go wobbly. There's no time to raise your children less in church. There's no time to raise your children with less of an understanding of the Bible. This is no time to back off of your involvement in the work of God. There's no time to get more like the world. There's no time to go wobbly, George. Paul, in Acts chapter 9, is at the beginning of his ministry. And you know what it says about him? It says, Saul, his name had not been changed to Paul then, increased the more in strength. Same word. And confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. So the what? God says, be strong. What's the way? We'll come back to this maybe another time. But let me talk to you a little bit. How do you get strong? Supposing I said, uh, Pastor Dillon, I'd like to help you get strong. So from now on, just be strong. And all of a sudden, he can bench press 300 pounds. Because I said, be strong. And he said, all right, I'm strong. And all of a sudden, he, he can take a, a, a heavy bag and punch it without even putting his shoulder behind it and his weight into it and move it halfway across the gym because I told him to be strong. Well, I'll tell you what, if you go to a trainer and you say, I want to get in really good shape, they get a lot of things they have you do. Uh, they'll, they'll tell you what to eat and they'll tell you what not to eat and they'll tell you when to eat it. And they'll tell you how much of it to eat. And they'll tell you what supplements to take. And they'll tell you how much sleep you have to get. And they'll tell you that you've got to exercise. And they'll tell you that you know, you've got to do different exercises on different days. And, and they'll push you on the exercises. And, and if you want to develop muscle strength, they tell you that you have to do every exercise to exhaustion. You just do what you can do easily. You'll never get any stronger. You've got to take whatever you're doing, 100 pounds on a bench press. And you do it 10 times, you got to push and try to get out 11. And if you get 11, you got to try for 12, and you don't stop until you can't get the last repetition out. So how do I get strong? Well, let me give you some simple thoughts, but reminders about the way to be strong. We get strong through the Word of God. I referenced a couple of verses from Psalm 119. There are... Similar verses in Psalm 19 where it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. How many of you got to watch some of the Lions Cowboys game today? Another almost for the Lions. Wouldn't the last few seconds, Cowboys fixed a uh, field goal, won the game? I'm not against that. I watched a little bit. My wife and I went to visit her mom today at the memory care facility and, and on the way out they had it on the television so I, I put the record button on the TV didn't watch it this afternoon then later on before I came to church I, I put the highlights on I watched them I was curious what happened I'm not against that but you know a guy will think nothing of sitting down for three and a half hours and watching a football game But if you asked him to read the Bible for an hour, he'd think you were crazy. 
Now, you know I've been just personally impressed to the Lord to start reading the Bible through once a month. I've done it since a year ago, July. So I finished my September reading early, and I'm, uh, I'm in the middle of First Samuel for my October reading. And so I still don't think I could ever do that. It's about 30 pages a day. I, I still don't have time to read 30 pages a day. And we're going, I'm not saying you should, but let me ask you a question. What if, what if you got, oh, a tenth of an ounce of gold for every five pages of the Bible you read? So you read 50 pages, you get an ounce of gold, that's 1,200 bucks. You think you might do that? I got one yes from Mrs. Mitchell. So pray for their finances. <laughs> why don't you read the Bible more? I'll tell you why I don't read the Bible more. I'll tell you why some of you don't read it even on a regular daily basis. I'll tell you why some of you don't even read it through in a year. And I'll tell you the result of it. You don't read it because you don't think it is worth as much as the Word of God tells you it is. And the result of it is you are weak in your Christianity. And people are drawn astray and they're led into false teaching. And some fancy sounding guy with a big smile and a smooth personality comes on the television. And they go off in the air because they do not know the Word of God. Be strong. But wait a minute. Let me give you a second way to be strong. This one's a little strange. It's from Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. And the Bible says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And here's the second way the Bible says to gain strength, not only by the word, but by waiting. Now, the word waiting is used in two ways. I think they're both uh, an appropriate application. Uh, if I go to the restaurant, the person who brings my food is called now a server, and if it's a male, it used to be called a waiter. And they'd say, what do you do for a living? He'd say, I wait table. Now, he didn't mean he just stood around and waited all day by a table. He made, he brought you your food and he refilled your beverages and he tried to fix anything the kitchen didn't get right and he tried to suggest that you get dessert because the more you spend, the larger 15 or 20 percent of your bill is going to be for his tip and he was there serving you. Did you know that serving makes you stronger than sitting? Did you know that doing something for God will make you stronger in your Christian life than doing nothing for God? It was Brother Scott Cowling's father, Wayne Cowling, who talked to me about starting more Sunday school classes and, and getting newer Christians involved in working in those classes. And he said, he said, we like to think we're great teachers and we got this adult class, but he said, you get a guy and have him teach second graders, he'll learn more studying his lesson for the second grade than he'll ever learn listening to you teach your lesson. And he was right. But, but it also, the word wait means to look patiently. You know how you get strong? Well, you don't stop when things don't work out like you want them to. You don't give up when things don't come together in the time frame you think they should have. You don't run away when things don't go your way. You don't go and throw a fit because somebody didn't treat you like you wanted to be treated. No, you're in the place God put you, and you just stay there. Like Joshua waiting 40 days for Moses to come back. And this goes along with it. We get strong by working. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 5, when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need the one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and to become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Did you know knowing the Word of God is really important, but using the Word of God is equally important? And having that time where you put the Word of God in practice, giving people the gospel, teaching a Sunday school class, using the Word of God, you get strong by the Word, you get strong by waiting, you get strong by working. You get strong by walking. Galatians chapter 5 tells us about that. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I'll say more about it later. But do you know the hardest thing we have to do is remember to walk in the Spirit? What does that mean? Look, 
I'm going to boil it down real simply for you. I'll talk more about it later on. We're told to be filled with the Spirit. We're told to walk. We're told to abide in Christ. We're told to take up the cross of the Lord and follow Him. And it really it all means the same thing. As you do stuff in life, you're either depending on yourself or you're depending on God. You're thinking, I got this. I can do this. You're thinking, Lord, help me. I'll say more about that when we get a little further in the sermon. And then let me suggest one other thing that helps us get strong. We get strong, the Bible says, not only by the Word, not only by waiting, not only by working, not only by walking. We get strong by weakness. That's a paradox. But here's what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, the Apostle Paul asked God to remove a thorn in his flesh, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ rests upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions distresses for Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then am I strong. You know what the Bible's saying there? God is looking for strong people who will help him out. God is looking for people who know they're terribly weak and come to him for strength and rely on him to serve them. The knowledge that you are unable to do something God wants you to do doesn't t- disqualify you. It's the first qualification. And we gain strength by knowing we don't have it. And then we rely on the Lord Jesus and the Spirit of God and ask for His help instead of thinking we've maybe got it all figured out ourselves. We'll talk next time about the avenue be strong in the Lord. Father, help us tonight not to be weak, not to have an attitude of weakness, but have an attitude of not our strength, but your strength. Not our ability, but your ability. Not we're going to show them how we can do it, but Lord, we're going to trust you, and we're going to go do it by your grace. And they'll see in spite of our weakness that your strength is sufficient, and you're a great God. Lord, convict us that we've been weak. And help us to be willing to put into practice the things that would make us strong. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. Let's just imagine I'm going to take a little survey tonight out bring this lapel mic down and go by each one of you and say, how much have you read your Bible the last seven days? How many days out of the last seven have you read the Bible at least four or five minutes? Tell me how many tracts you've passed out. Tell me me what your prayer life is like. Where would we be? This is no time to go wobbly. Our world needs the gospel of Christ more than it ever has. Our nation is more divided than it's been in a very long time. And people don't need to have a bunch of timid, weak-kneed, embarrassed, shuffling, stuttering Christians who don't take a stand for the Lord Jesus. They need somebody that's willing to be strong. Tell one of you here tonight and you say, I am God's child and heaven is my home and I need to apply some of the things I've heard tonight in my life. You pray with me about that. God's spoken to me. If you say that, hold your hand up high.